This is the second lecture in Tools in Scientific Computing. In this lecture, we're going to look at conditionals and loops. Upon opening the Anaconda Navigator, we launch Jupyter Lab and we end up on this screen. So let me create a new notebook. I'm using the Python 3 kernel. Okay, so let us consider the creation of an array in order to demonstrate some of these ideas. So let me import NumPy. So let me create a random array. So let me create a is equal to np dot random dot rand int. So this is a function rand int. It creates random integers between the given the specified range. So in this case, the range is 0 to 10. Let me create a one dimensional array. So let me have uh, eight elements in the array. So let me print out the value of a as well. Okay, so we have a random array a and it has eight elements. So suppose I want to loop over all the elements of the array a and print them one by one. So how do we do that? So we use a loop that is an iteration. So we do for i in a. So we can simply do this. We can print i. Okay, so this prints out all the values of the array a. Okay, this is a very easy way of printing out all the values. Let me query the length of the array a. So I will write. So let me print out this. So np dot shape of a. So it says it is eight rows and it has, I mean, it has eight elements. So let me print out the np dot size of a. The size of a is eight. So this says the total number of uh, elements that a has. So what I can do is I can instead of uh, looping over all the elements in a. So it means for i which belongs in a. Okay, so this is So instead of looping it like this, we could have alternately looped it like this for i in np dot a range 0 comma np dot size a. Then we print a i. Okay, so we've obtained all the elements in the array a what is this np dot a range so let me show you so np dot a range is a way of obtaining an integer range from an initial number say say suppose the number is 0 and the number of elements so the number of elements suppose i keep 5 so it should output 0 1 2 3 4 so let me see Okay, so it does output 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So the first argument to the function is the opening number, and the last argument to this function is the number of elements. So let us dissect what we did over here. So np dot size of a was equal to 8. So for i in np dot a range, 0 to size of a. So let me actually print that out so it gives 0 1 2 3 4 all the way to 7 then i so we loop using an iterator i and we print a bracket i so 
in the first loop i takes the value 0 because for i in this particular array it will take the value 0 so it will first print a0 then it will print a1 then it will print a2 it will print a3 and so on in fact let me prettify this print statement a bit better so here i will write a i equals so this is literal it will print out a opening bracket then it will print out the value of i then it will literally print out the closing bracket and the equal to sign then it will print out ai okay so here we have it so this is how we can literally print all the elements of an array so this is an example so i've shown you two examples or three examples of printing out all the elements of an array this is quite handy when you write codes of finite differences because you want to loop over various elements on the grid so np dot size is a way of not hard coding the length of the grid i can effectively do this as well this would output the same number but usually it is not or rather quite often it is not a good idea to hard code the number okay let me create a two dimensional array so let me say b so let me create a markdown okay so let me create a random array so b is equal to np dot rand random dot rand int says so 0 to 10 size equal to say i have a 4 cross 4 random array or let me have 4 cross 5 random array so let me print out b So this is the matrix B. It contains five columns and four rows. So how do we print out each element of an array? Now remember, just because I'm printing out each element of an array doesn't mean that iterators or loops should be used for that. You can use loops to achieve some computation inside the loop as well. In this particular case, we are doing it just to showcase or highlight how a loop works so we can do for i in b okay print i so what do this will do is it will print out all the elements in a given row in b so let me print out something pretty Okay, so it has printed me four times and it has printed me the entire row. Now, suppose I don't want to print the entire row, I want to print out each element. So, remember that i now contains all the elements of the row because you are printing i, it means that you are essentially printing all the rows. So, now you have to loop over all the elements of i. So, how do we do that? We say for i in b for j in i print j what this will do is j will loop over all the elements of i where i is the row of the matrix b and it will print everything one by one okay there you have it these are all the elements of b in fact we can use another inbuilt function of the numpy module to print all the elements without having to resort to this kind of a nested loop this kind of a double loop in which there is an outer loop and then there's an inner loop is called as a nested loop
in fact this loops over all the rows and this loops over all the elements of a row so this is what is happening so it picks up one row it prints all the element of that row and it goes to the next row it prints all the elements of that row goes to the next row prints all the elements of the row and so on so instead of having this kind of a nested loop structure we can simply call the function so for i in np dot nd iter b print i so there you have it so nd iter is an n dimensional iteration over all the elements of b because b contains how many rows and how many columns it is python can actually look into that create the nested loop for you and run the loop over all the elements you don't have to do a nested loop for that so let us quickly verify so let us print np dot size of b so the total size of b is 20 because 4 cross 5 is 20 np dot shape of b it's four rows and five columns so this is how you can query the matrix size and the number of elements let us now proceed to write down some conditionals in particular we are going to look at how we can check for certain values and how we can break loops because this is quite important when you are doing scientific computation so let us print out the value of a for reference okay so a is this array now suppose i want to print out all the values of a up until the point it reaches its first zero okay so how do we do that so let us first construct the loop for i in a okay or in fact let me do it the c way or the matlab way so for i in np dot a range 0 np dot size of a so now if a i is equal to 0 so this is a conditional which checks whether a i is equal to 0 then we have to break this loop so once it encounters a break condition it will break out of that loop completely it will not execute the loop any further okay else print ai so what's going on over here so whatever we are doing is we are looping over all the indices inside this so let me just print this for reference so we are looping over all these elements so it checks it checks whether ai is equal to 0 or not so whether a0 is equal to 0 no a1 is it equal to 0 no a2 and so on so we see that a5 will be equal to 0 okay a5 will be equal to 0 so it should break the loop so let us see what happens so what do we have 72769 72769 and the moment we reach a5 it will check if a5 is equal to 0 yes a5 is equal to 0 so it will break the loop so this is how you can have a conditional inside your loop to break the loop now suppose you are interested to know how many so this is a very small loop so you can tell pretty much straight away that there has been five number of elements prior to reaching its first zero but suppose you want to count the total number of times 
or you want to suppose I want to count how many zeros are there in the array A. Yeah, let's do that. So let me copy this template. So we want to number of zeros in the array. So yeah. So we will write. So we have to first define a counter. We will define counter is equal to zero. It means that I have a counter which will increment each time I encounter zero. So if a i equal to zero, right, then counter will be counter plus one. Else it has to do nothing. So let us run this. So in fact, at the end of the loop, we should print counter. So it gives an answer two. So it has counted it twice. In fact, suppose we want to modify this loop to tell us at which indices zero has occurred. Okay, we want to tell so we know that it has occurred at index number five and index number seven. So how do we do that? So let me create C index. So let me initialize it as zero. So the moment it encounters a i equal to zero, we will print zero encountered at location and then we will print out the value of i in fact we did not require c index if we wanted to store something else we would have so we just print out the index so let me run this and see what happens so zero encountered at five and at seven let us now use our knowledge acquired so far to create a simple program for bubble sort so what is bubble sort so imagine we have an array something like this 5 4 3 2 1 and we want to sort it in ascending order so we first look at these two elements so because this element is smaller than this element we will swap then we will look at these two elements because this is smaller than this we will again swap now between these two elements this is smaller than this so again we will swap now between these two elements this is smaller than this so we will swap So notice how the largest element is rising through the array like a bubble. Now, so this is the first loop. In the second sort of iteration that we will have, we will start with this. So now, because we know that the largest element has gone all the way to the end, we need to only loop between these many elements and we have to perform the same checks so let us check between these two three is smaller than four so this will swap so three four two one five now between these two so this will be three two four one five now between these two so this will be three four two one sorry three two one four five now between these two five is larger than four so there will be nothing no swap over here okay so in the second set of iterations we have effectively transferred the next largest element to the next to last location so it has risen like a bubble but it is not going all the way to the end because it is not the largest element okay so now what? So now we have 3, 2, 1, 4, 5. 
now we have to loop over only these elements and make the same pairs of comparison so 2 is smaller than 3 so we will swap then we will check this so 1 is smaller than 3 so we will swap and we end because we only have to loop over these many elements because these are already at the end through through this these two loops we've already obtained them sorted so now this third largest element has also gone to the end now we have to perform a check between these two elements so what is this so one is smaller than two so we will perform a swap so finally we will get one two three four five so this was the third iterate and this was the fourth iterate so this particular algorithm of sorting of an array is called as bubble sort because each subsequent larger largest number rises through the array like a bubble okay like a bubble rises in water so as you can imagine since we have five elements we have to loop we have to perform this check four times and for each time so one two three four and inside each loop how many pairs do we have so over here we had one pair two pairs three and four so we had four pairs over here over here we had sorry we did not have four we had only three because this was the starting area so we did a swap once twice thrice and then four yeah so then what did we do we took this array we did a swap one two three so we did a swap three times we did a check three times over here we did a check one two twice and lastly we did a check once okay so depending on what you're doing so if you look so in the first outermost loop you did four checks in the second outermost loop you did three checks in the third iteration you did two checks and in the fourth iteration you did one check you see that this sum remains constant it is equal to the number of elements so this gives an idea that you have to perform the operation for you have to loop over the entire array four times but each time you have to check lesser and lesser number of pairs okay so once you have achieved the highest element all the way to the end you don't need to check it till the last element you can check it till the second last element once you've sorted the second last element you have to sort it till the third last element and so on so that's how you save on some computations so let us now encode whatever we have seen in that algorithm of bubble sort in python so the first thing is to create that particular array usually in your program you will have a generated array by some experiment or some numerical means but for this particular example let us create this particular array so a equal to np dot array then we will have five four three two one so let me print a let me print the size of a as well we'll require this later on so a is 54321 and the size of array a is 5 so let me now create the outermost loop so what is the outermost loop so this particular orange box is the first loop or the first element of the outermost loop this is the second element of the outermost loop this is the third element of the outermost loop and the fourth okay so for five elements it loops from one two three four and 
I could have simply done a loop from one to four, but I want to generalize it. I don't want to hard code that value of four. So what I will do is, I will query the size of a and accordingly set the loops. So I will do for i in np dot a range one to np dot size of a. So if we want to see what this loop sequence will actually look like, let us print it out. So it will be one, two, three, four. Okay. So np dot a range one to five. So essentially, this means np dot a range. Which goes from one and ends to ends till four because np dot a range excludes the final value. It increments by one and it excludes the final value. So it will be one, two, three, four. It will not include five. If you wanted to include five, we have to input six over here. Okay. So the next loop will be the inner loop. So inside each of these. Inside each of these orange boxes, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, and one. So as the outermost array increases, the number of checks we have to do inside each array, that num those number of checks they reduce. So, and how do they reduce? It reduces such that one plus four remains constant, two plus three remains constant, three plus two remains constant, and so on. So we will make over here for j in np dot a range zero to np dot size of a minus one. Okay. So in fact, this should be minus i. It should not be minus one. Minus i. So when i is equal to Two, okay. So let let us just print it out as well. Let me set i equal to two, and let me print this out. So when i is equal to two, I would loop j over zero, one, two. So this is i equal to two. So this is the zeroth loop. This is one. This is two. So I would do the check three times. Let me change it to i equal to one. So let me run this. So one two zero one two three. So this is zero. This is one. This is two. This is three. Okay. And actually, it corroborates with the index. So this is index number zero, index number one, index number two, index number three. So this is how we can achieve the nested sequence that we have. One is the orange box and one is the green box. So now that we have our nested loop structure, we will check if a j plus one, okay, if it is smaller than a j, then what do we have to do? We have to do the following. We have to swap a j plus one and a j. So the way to do it is, we will first assign a j plus one to a temporary buffer. We will update the value of a j with uh, a j plus one with a j, and then we will update the value of a j with temp. So this ensures that none of the variables are overwritten. So temporary is just like a temporary buffer. So if you just think about it, it will be clear. So that's it. That's pretty much the loop. So yeah. So the other thing is, if this happens, you execute this. If this condition is true, it will execute all this. And if we wanted to do something else, so we will write else. You can say print no swapping required. 
okay so if that condition is not satisfied we don't need to swap anything okay it's already sorted okay yeah so let us exit the scope of the if else statement and let me write over here let me print it out so let me print the value of j and the array a so that bubble sort behavior would be apparent lastly no yeah that's it so let's do this so let me run this cell and let's see what happens actually we are out of the scope of this function so i'm glad this error came up so the function of the if else statement is for all the statements which are at an indentation from this particular if so all these statements are inside this scope this statement is inside this scope this particular statement has to be inside the scope of this for loop so we will press tab and put it over here so now for each time this inner check happens we would have printed the value of j and the evolution of the array a okay so previously it was something like this so after all the inner checks are done it has printed the final sorted list after each inner check so look at this 4 3 2 1 5 so this checks out with this final result of this first loop then we have 3 2 1 4 5 this checks out with the final result of this particular inner loop this is the final result of that particular inner loop and this also checks out so we don't want to print out only the final output we want to print it out dynamically we want to look at how a has evolved over all the iterations so we have to move the print statement into this particular loop so it has to have an indentation so indentation is obtained by pressing tab okay so let me press let me run this loop okay ah, so a was already sorted so we have to run all the cells again okay. so let me run this cell let me run this cell again okay so 0 1 2 3 this is the first orange box inside the first orange box look 4 and 5 have been swapped so we are at this step 3 and 5 have been swapped 2 and 5 have been swapped 1 and 5 have been swapped this is the second orange box this one 3 and 4 swapped 2 and 4 swapped 1 and 4 swapped then this is the and this particular thing is this particular orange box okay you have two swaps and this is the last thing there is nothing to swap okay so this is how we can encode a bubble sort and through this we have looked at several things the let me just summarize it over here indentation is important so indentation is achieved by pressing tab not by pressing spaces okay this is a single tab so whatever is indented from this particular for loop will be executed inside that for loop so for example this for loop is inside this so it is indented whatever is indented inside this would be executed inside this innermost for loop so all these things are indented inside this so inside each loop this will be executed whatever is indented for this if statement would be executed inside this if block so suppose i were to remove this so the if statement would only execute these two commands this is outside the if statement so doing this would indent it back into the if statement in programming languages like c this is not a big deal because you have curly braces blocking out sections of the code in this course i am already assuming that you have some basic knowledge of programming otherwise 
it would be quite difficult to jump straight into Python. Let me in fact now generate a random array of integers. Instead of hard coding this particular example array, we can choose a as np.random.randint. So in opening value is 0, closing value is 20 and let us sample 7 values. Okay. So let me run this cell. And let me run this cell. So let us look at this. So 3 and 8, it's already sorted because 8 is larger than 3. So no swap required. Great. Then we have this array between 8 and 9, there is no swap required. Great. No swap required. Between 9 and 5, there is a swap required. Okay. So this is swapped. Now between 9 and 19, there is no swap required because once you have swapped 9 and 5, you end up with this configuration. But between 9 and 19, there is no swap required. Great. So then this is how the entire loop works. Have a look at it. Try to implement other loop algorithms on your own. This is by far not the fastest sorting algorithm. In fact, you may wonder why I bother doing all this. I mean, there surely must be some inbuilt function in numpy which can help you do all this and if you thought that you are correct there is a there is an inbuilt function to do that so let me run this once to reinitialize the value of the array a because running this cell this particular cell would swap everything inside a so we don't want that so now let me print a so this is a, I have reinitialized with a random number. So each time I call that cell, I'll have a random array. So then I can simply say b equal to np dot sort a. Okay. So let me print what b is. So this is the sorted array a. So to conclude in this particular lecture, we've looked at conditionals, we've looked at loops. And we've looked at how we can combine all those informations to create a very simple implementation of bubble sort. And lastly, we have seen how to make use of the inbuilt function of NumPy to sort arrays without having to write so much of code. So with this, we conclude this particular lecture and I'll see you next time. Bye.